This knowledge is the most deeply occulted or hidden information that exists on this planet. You will not find any more hidden information. This is the thing that all the distractions are there for, to keep you from learning. The endless trivialities, the nonsense you hear on the news, all the video games, all the nonsense television, the sports, you know, it's all there to keep people from understanding this. From my years of being inside occult traditions that are very, very dark, I'm telling you, this is what they don't want you to know. That's why it's not the exoteric. It's not given to the masses. It's the esoteric. It is reserved for the few. And there's a reason for that. It's been deliberately hidden away and kept from the general public in order to create and maintain a power differential. The word occult is simply derived from Latin, the Latin adjective occultus. Occultus in Latin means hidden, hidden from sight. And it's derived from the Latin noun oculus, which means eye, okay? The word ocular in English means related to the eye or related to sight or vision. So what the occult is, it is a body of knowledge that has been hidden away for a specific reason. And we're going to get into what that reason is. From the, the term oculus or eye in Latin comes the verb occultare. Occultare means to hide, to conceal, or to keep secret. To keep hidden from the eye so that it cannot be seen. The information regarding natural law is occulted knowledge. It is knowledge that has been hidden from humanity. It's held by the few. Which, which is represented here at the top of this pyramid. You can look at this as a pyramid representing knowledge or ignorance. Down here, you have no knowledge, the igno ignorant masses. And up here, you have the people who are in the know, right, who have this knowledge about how natural law works and are actually using it for a certain reason. We're going to get to that next, what that is. Now, why would anybody want to hide knowledge that is extremely important? Well, there's a very specific reason. But before we even get to that, we have to talk about what is this occulted knowledge. Occult knowledge constitutes two things. There's two general bodies of occult knowledge. In, in the actual mystery traditions and in occult schools, they talk about these as arcana. A-R-C-A-N-A. -A, arcana. Ar the word arcana is also Latin. It means knowledge. Okay, that's all it means. So there's two bodies of knowledge. There's one body of knowledge in the occult called lesser arcana, or the minor arcana. This means the knowledge of the microcosm, the knowledge of the small things, okay? It doesn't mean it's less important. It means it's dealing with the individual units of consciousness, the human psyche, the, the psyche of the individual, knowledge of human consciousness, how it works, how it operates, what our motivations are things like that. The second body of occult knowledge is called the greater arcana or the major arcana. All right. And again, this doesn't refer to that it's more important. It refers to it is the macrocosmic understanding, the understanding of the very large laws of nature that govern the, the, the macrocosm. Okay. So universal laws are part of the greater arcana of occult knowledge. And what I call here today, under the umbrella, the term natural law falls into that second category of greater knowledge, the greater arcana of occult knowledge. And what these natural laws are, are unseen and universal spiritual laws. We're going to talk, we could talk about the word natural here too. Natural is derived from Egyptian and other Middle Eastern tradition languages, okay? The word netter in, in Egyptian, which would have been spelled without vowels, if we transliterated it, it would be N-T-R in English. Netter means spirit in Egyptian, in ancient Egyptian. The, the, the suffix A-L, even in English today, but if you go back into Arabic languages and, uh, you know, ancient Middle Eastern languages, um, A-L as a suffix actually means of or related to or having come from. 
okay? So natural, if you put these root words together, neter and al, right? It means of or related to the realm of spirit, of or related to God, actually. The word neter also meant God, spirit or God, okay? So this is the spiritual domain, the laws that actually are operating in the unseen realm. Okay, now, they manifest in the physical realm. We're going to talk about that. Okay, because that's the, the operation that it trickles down from. It starts in the spiritual domain, and then it manifests in the physical domain. All right? So, it's important to understand these two bodies of knowledge. Lesser arcana is about the monad, or the individuated unit of consciousness of the human being. And then the greater knowledge is about the laws that govern the macrocosmic universe. Why is this knowledge hidden away from people about how natural law works and how consciousness works? It's been deliberately hidden away and kept from the general public in order to create and maintain a power differential. I'm telling you that's what they're trying to, from my years of being inside occult traditions that are very, very dark. I'm telling you, this is what they don't want you to know. The powers that be want to seek to keep this information hidden from the people of the earth at all costs because understanding this information about natural law will level the playing field and put an end to the currently entrenched systems of control that are operating on the earth. So therefore, let's define natural law. The simple definition of natural is inherent having a basis in nature, reality, and truth, not made or caused by humankind. Okay? And again, the origin of the word, neter in Egyptian means spirit, and all means of or related to. So of or related to spirit, it is all of nature, the spiritual domain. See, this is the other part. People believe that the spiritual domain is separate from the physical domain. This is a huge thread and a huge central focus in all of my work. If you think the spiritual domain is not where you are at now because you're in the physical domain, you're mistaken. If you think that the spiritual domain is someplace other than the physical domain, you're also mistaken. If you place emphasis on one above the other and say, well, this one takes precedence and this one's not important. Either way you do it, whether you say the spiritual is more important and the world of matter should not be given any significance, it's imbalanced and it's not true. Natural means spiritual. The, these words could be used interchangeably. So when I'm talking about natural law, I mean spiritual law, unseen spiritual laws. The word law, the definition is an existing condition which is both binding and immutable. So let's look at each one of these words existing. It means that it is present. It is present. Okay? It cannot be just ignored and expected that, oh, well, that doesn't make it true and it's, it's not going to have an effect. It's there. It's present. That's why it's a law that it's in operation. It is binding. Binding means it has an effect. It means it doesn't matter whether you believe that it has an effect. It doesn't matter whether you understand that it has an effect. It doesn't care. And this is another big hammer to the ego. The human ego wants to hear what it wants to hear. One of the things it wants to hear is the universe cares about you personally. It cares about John. It cares about Bob. It cares about Mary. It cares about Elizabeth, whatever. Okay? It cares about you individually as a being. And now, you could go so far as to say you believe that the creator of the universe cares about you. I'm not, I'm not denying anybody or saying don't th think that. What I'm saying is that the laws of the universe don't care about you. Let's look at the dynamics between discovery and belief. The difference between discovery and belief. Because again, natural law is capable of being discovered, understood, and harmonized with. Now, does that sound like a religion? Religion asks people to believe, accept, and do without question. What this is, is saying, this exists, you're bound by it. The best you can do is to understand its operation like you would understand gravity and therefore not just walk toward the edge of a 200-foot cliff 
that is bottom, bottomed by jagged rocks. If you're intelligent and you understand how the law of gravity works, you won't do that behavior. So natural law has nothing to do with religion. It's not a belief system. It's a science. It is a discoverable operation that is already in effect that we can either understand and align our behavior to or remain ignorant of and suffer as a result of that ignorance because it's all already in effect. So when it comes to belief, the clown that's going to jump over the cliff saying, I don't believe in gravity, what's going to happen? Down he goes because belief is irrelevant because natural law does not care about you. It is in effect no matter what you do. Well, let's look at consciousness and the human brain, okay? Because consciousness is an intangible force, okay? It's something that exists, but you can't really see it. Many, many people even have a hard time explaining what it is. But there is physiological expressions for consciousness in, in the physical domain, and the brain is one of them. And of course, people will say, well, don't leave out the heart. Of course, the heart is also very important. Heart has an even bigger electromagnetic field than the brain and is tied into the physiology in an even more complex way than the brain is. But we need to understand the basic structure of the brain to understand the types of imbalances that go on within it that lead to these debilitating conditions within humanity that continue to create suffering for us. So let's look at how the brain and consciousness actually work. People will also try to give ridiculously overcomplicated and mystified definitions of what consciousness means. And many people are even scared of the term, okay? We have to demystify these terms and bring them down to real simple English and real simple concepts that the average person can grasp, okay? And stop trying to make it more complicated than it is. Being conscious of something, meaning having consciousness of it, is an ability of the being to recognize patterns. Remember, this is all about pattern recognition. To recognize patterns and meaning with respect to events that are taking place or have taken place, okay, both within oneself, okay, in the inner realm, in the, the lesser realm, the realm of the individuated consciousness, and in the realm in which the self exists and operates, the macrocosm. So let, let's break it down, right? Ability of a being to recognize patterns and meaning with respect to events taking place within oneself, the microcosm, and in the macrocosmic world, the world at large. And the events taking place is the truth. So it's our ability to accurately perceive truth of what has happened and what is happening. That's consciousness. That's consciousness. And it's, it's made way overly complicated by people. It's mostly made overly complicated in the New Age movement, again, which I, I can't stress enough how big of a deception it is. So that's what consciousness is. Now, how does consciousness express? There's a difference between what it is and how it expresses in our life. Consciousness expresses. I ask people, just tell me, what are the ways you could ever make yourself known to any other being? How can any other being come to know who you are in this incarnation, in this physical manifestation? How could they possibly come to know you? How could you manifest yourself or make yourself known to them? And there's only three ways. Thoughts, emotions, and actions. Okay? And I would say speech falls into the combination of thoughts and emotions. The speech is also a form of action, and it derives from what we have thought up to this point and the emotions that we have, and we can express it through speech. So thought, emotion, and action. Thought, you have to look at as the creative force that is the expression for consciousness within the individual, okay? So it's a neutral force. You don't look at your thoughts as masculine or feminine, do you? But you do look at them as creative forces. In order for anything to manifest in the physical domain, it had to first exist as a thought. This computer, somebody had to envision all the parts, how it works, how it's put together, okay? This camera equipment, the clothes you're wearing, the seats, everything that exists had to first exist in the realm of thought. Had to. 
by law. Then it comes into physical manifestation through action. Your emotions are a polarized component. You can look at it as it is feminine aspect of consciousness because other people don't feel your emotions. They could perceive or set or sense them. You're the one who's feeling the emotions in your physiology. It's an internal expression. You feel emotions inwardly inside in the physiology. Hence, this is a feminine expression for consciousness. It is something that is not externalized and put out. It is something that is felt within. So the emotions in the mind-body-spirit connection are the spirits in which we do something. Okay, so that's the feminine force or the spirit. Then there's a marriage between them. Okay, so you can look at thoughts as the creative essence, which then blends with or marries to the feminine. Now, see, we're getting into a notion that is taught in all many different religious traditions. It's called the Trinity. And I challenge anybody, go and look at any of the trinities that exist in any of the religions. You can go back to Babylon. You can go to the Indus Valley traditions. You can go to the Egyptian and Comitian traditions, the Christian traditions. Every single religious tradition that is taught of a trinity Okay? It is always a father creator, a sacred feminine figure okay, of some kind that the father then impregnates or inseminates in some form. And then th from that offspring is born a male child, always. Okay? What we're talking about here is the father being the mind, the creative essence, then the spirit or the emotions being the sacred feminine essence, okay? Or the Holy Spirit, the emotions. And then the child, the male child, is behavior. It is the active or masculine principle that actually interacts with the physical world to change it. And hence, that is the only way to actually save ourselves. And again, people in religious thinking will immediately attack this and say, you're saying that saving ourselves will not come through faith. Yes, I am. Saving ourselves will only come through action. Action will save humanity. Faith will not do it. So sorry to, to again, smash another egoic attachment that people have to religious notions. Because one of the nonsense is that you need to believe in something to, to be saved from the current human condition. You don't need to believe in a thing. You need to know the truth. Well, Christians don't want to hear that because the controllers in the church who came from the dark priest class gave them this nonsense that all you have to do is believe and everything will magically change. Well, good luck with that. When people's behaviors have no alignment with morality, you think your belief's going to change something? The expressions for consciousness are thoughts, emotions, and actions which are likened to in the consciousness community of mind, spirit, and body. And it's a trinity. A father creator, which is the thoughts, the mind, the feminine essence, which is the, the mother of the trinity, the emotions, the inward aspects, the spirit. And then they give birth when the thoughts and the emotions come together they give birth to action in the world, which is the male child. I, this is very important to understand. I hope everybody is clear. This is our internal trinity, which constitutes the expressions for consciousness.